Hello and welcome everybody that's just joining in and we'll wait about one more minute or so and then we'll get started. If you're just joining, feel free to put in the chat where you are calling in from. We got people from all over right now. Thanks for sharing. Hello, welcome everybody. We'll wait a little bit longer and then we'll get started. Just let a few more people join in. If you haven't done so already, share in the chat where you're calling in from. All righty, we will get started. Thank you all for joining us today for our wellness webinar. I will send it over to Laura for our, to get going. All right, thank you, Anna. Hello and welcome everyone to this month's wellness webinar, Sleep 2.0. My name is Laura Heyman and I am one of the wellbeing specialists with Healthier Together. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar will be recorded and this slide deck will be sent out to all attendees after the webinar. We will also be sharing the slide deck and recording to Yammer. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to utilize the chat feature. If we don't get a chance to answer your questions today, we will be sure to reach out to you individually and we will also share any follow-up notes that we think everyone could benefit from. Before we get into today's content, I just wanted to remind everyone about Healthier Together. Healthier, Healthier Together is your one-stop shop for everything wellness. It has resources, programs, challenges, and much more. And better yet, it is free for all Medtronic employees. Here is the information on how to register. If you haven't done so already, we encourage you to take advantage of this wonderful resource. We chose to present this webinar on sleep because many of you have requested a more in-depth presentation, not only about getting back to and how to stay asleep, but on different aspects of sleep as well. Before we begin, I just want to share an interesting fact. According to the Sleep Foundation, at 43%, Hawaii has the highest percentage of adults who get seven or fewer hours of sleep per night which I mean, maybe it's paradise, so you don't wanna sleep away during paradise. And South Dakota comes at 26% with the lowest percentage. So before we get into the content, I'll be launching a poll here. So you should see the poll pop up in front of you. This is just for us to gather some more information about where you all are currently. So the first question is, what do your current sleep habits look like? So you answer, check all that apply. And then the second question is, what are you most interested in hearing today? And those are the topics that we'll be covering today. So you get a little preview of the agenda. So take a moment, to answer this quick question and we'll share the results at the end. Got about 30% participated. So I'll give you a few more seconds here. What do your current sleep habits look like? And what are you most interested in hearing today? A few more seconds here to answer. Let's let everyone get their response in. All righty, I'm going to end the poll here and I'll share the results. So pretty mixed for the first question. Majority frequently wake throughout the night and can't get back to sleep or don't feel rested when you wake up in the morning. And overall not getting enough sleep on average per night. And then 
what are you most interested in hearing today? I know you're probably, you want to hear about every single one of these and the good news, you'll get to hear about them, but it's just good, good for us to know kind of what you're interested in learning about and yeah, tips to get back to sleep, better quality sleep, brain biology. Perfect. So we will cover all of that today and we will get into sleep basics. Wonderful. All right. So sleep basics. I'm going to quickly go over some sleep basic recommendations, sleep cycles, and sleep deprivation. Sleep recommendations, you probably know this already. Um, how many hours do we need? As we age, as you can see, we need fewer hours of sleep per night. So take a moment to just glance at these recommendations, just kind of a quick refresher for not only yourself, but um, anyone else that you might be taking care of or any kiddos at home, um, the recommendations for sleep. Sleep cycles, each stage of sleep um, plays an important in allowing your mind and body to wake up refreshed. So quickly go over stage one, the non-REM sleep. This is where we are falling asleep or very light sleep, involuntary twitching of muscles. Stage two, again, non-REM sleep, stage two. This is light sleep. This is when light sleep starts to happen. This is also where your body temperature begins to drop heart rate slows down and memory making and sorting information occur. Stage three of non-REM sleep, this is deep sleep. This is where muscles deeply relax, blood pressure and breathing rate drops and restorative sleep begins. And finally, stage four REM sleep here. This is where vivid dreaming and brain activity and temporal muscle paralysis begins. This is just a chart I thought that was pretty interesting to look at the different stages and how we like how many hours, how many stages we can go through an eight hour sleep cycle. Um, so that was just super interesting. I thought we were just in chunks of different time, but we go through all of those sleep cycles many times during the night. Sleep deprivation um, and its negative side effects. We have all experienced sleep deprivation at some point in our lives. In the simplest form, sleep deprivation is getting less than the recommended amount of sleep per night. So of course, you probably are all aware of this, but um, the negative effects of sleep deprivation are impaired alert, uh, attentiveness, decreased coordination, decreased reaction time, decreased immune function, increased risk of obesity, obesity, blood pressure, heart attack, diabetes, and depression, increased body aches and pains, and it increases the erratic behavior of hunger hormones. Um, so now there are two main hunger hormones um, that regulate uh, ghrelin and leptin. I'm probably saying them incorrectly, but um, ghrelin, which is a stomach hormone, increases when your stomach is empty and signals to your brain when it's time to eat. Then, um, then when you eat, your levels decrease. Leptin is the hormone that controls a long-term energy balance, aka the satisfactory hormone. So if we are sleep deprived, those can kind of um, not balance out, like I said, they're erratic in their behavior. All right. And lastly, I would like to discuss a bit more in depth about the brain biology behind sleep. So brain biology, sleep significantly impacts brain function. The first thing that I will discuss is brain plasticity, oh my goodness, aka neuroplasticity, um, which enables the brain to pick up new skills, change and adapt to its environment stimuli, and ultimately learn new things. Recent studies have found that non-run sleep boosts the performance of new skills by restoring flexibility and neuroplasticity plasticity, which increases better learning and tasks performed after sleep. REM sleep stabilizes these improvements and prevents new learning from being erased from our memory. And um, another interesting brain biology and sleep I found was amyloid B and Alzheimer's disease. Well, what is am amyloid B? 
It's a large membrane protein that it normally plays an essential role in neural growth and repair. However, later in life, a corrupted form can destroy nerve cells and form plaque. Studies have shown that short-term sleep deprivation can change the levels of amyloid that can accumulate in the aging brain and cause, cause Alzheimer's disease. Excessive amyloid concentration dips during sleep and peaks during consciousness. A study involving mice showed sleeping mice cleared twice as much amyloid from their brains as conscious mice. These findings suggest that sleep helps the brain dispose of metabolic waste that accumulates while awake. Scientists believe the brain dep uh, dep deposits or disposes, excuse me, of amyloid in four ways. Moving it to the spine, pushing it across the blood brain barrier, breaking it down or absorbing it with other proteins or depositing it into, into plaques. Further studies are needed before a clear connection between poor sleep and Alzheimer's disease. But if future similar results are found, sleep length and quality could be an early modifiable risk factor and in event, interventions to improve sleep or maintain healthy sleep may prevent Alzheimer's disease. Now I'm going to hand it over to Kyle. Thank you. Yeah, good overview, Laura. Um, now I want to get into factors influencing sleep, whether it's your first time falling asleep for the night or the second or third time. There are many factors that could be limiting your ability to stay asleep or get back to sleep. Anna and I uh, have broken uh, it down into three buckets, environmental, physical, and mental and emotional factors. With each of these buckets, some factors might spill over into other buckets for similar reasons or different reasons altogether. As we go through each bucket with a little more detail, write down or even just keep in mind your nightly routine and see how things uh, may be working against your potential good sleep and the solutions for them. The environmental bucket, in most cases, are things we can control, add to our routine, or make adjustments to provide ideal sleeping conditions for the best uh, sleep possible. Most doctors recommend keeping the thermostat set between 60 to se uh, 67 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 to 19 degrees Celsius. Our bodies are programmed to experience a slight dip or lowering in core body temperature in the evenings. Turning the thermostat down uh, at night may help with temperature regulation and signal your body that it is time for bed. Loud noise disturbances during sleep can cause severe sleep fragmentation and disruption, which uh, can have negative impacts on your physical and mental health. So it should be no surprise when I say a quieter bedroom is ideal. For outside or unwanted noises, there are, uh, there are ways to block the noise. The whir of a fan uh, or a white noise machine can mask other sounds that might disrupt your sleep. Ambient sounds or soothing music at uh, an, an appropriate level uh, are also ways to block unwanted noise. Light levels influ influence your sleep and wake cycles as well. Eyes perceive light and signal the brain to produce hormones that help you stay alert and energized. At night, Darkness triggers the release of melatonin to induce sleepiness and relaxation. Exposure, exposure to light, whether it be from a lamp, natural sunlight, or from a device, can delay your circadian rhythms and prolong the onset of sleep. Even if you like to, for example, read in bed before you sleep, try to keep the light level as low as possible to help you fall asleep and stay asleep more easily. As, uh, as you see the, the word products uh, falling into the bucket, you are probably wondering what I mean by products. Uh, these are things like pillows, your mattress, sheets, even the clothes you wear to bed, extending to eye masks and aromatherapy products that aid in sleep. Most of these are dependent on personal preferences, but are definitely factors in setting you up for successful sleep from start to finish. Think about the age of your mattress. A newer mattress will support your body while you lay down uh, and sleep versus an older one might have the uh, uh, might not have the support and comfortability it used to. Same thing with pillows. 
if you are someone who isn't, isn't sensitive to certain smells, filling the bedroom with uh, certain essential oils like lavender can improve your sleep quality. Consider the elements of your sleeping environment. If you wake up during sleep, you might not be able to switch your mattress, but consider making an adjustment in other areas to facilitate getting you back to sleep. Moving into the physical factors of, uh, affecting sleep. This can include nutrition, your activity level during the day, technology, um, and also underlying health conditions or issues. The foods you eat throughout the day and week have an influence on sleep. Eating a healthy, balanced diet allows your body to receive key nutrients that affect uh, hormonal, pa uh, hormonal pathways involved in sleep. Nutrients like calcium, magnesium, and vitamins A, C, D, E, and K. As most of us understand the effects of caffeine on the body, it shouldn't be a surprise when I say limit or avoid that maybe that cup of coffee later in the afternoon if you really want a good night's sleep. Uh, consider, consider a dietary approach that's balanced in macronutrient consumption as well as rich uh, in those vitamins and minerals. Consistent daily activity or regular exercise uh, can help most people achieve better quality sleep. Keeping a consistent regimen of exercise reduces the time it takes to fall asleep and decreases the amount of time uh, someone might lie awake uh, in bed during the night. Also, physical activity can help alleviate uh, daytime sleepiness, which can help your body and circadian rhythm uh, be ready for sleep at the appropriate time based on your sleep schedule. There have been many studies and surveys on uh, exercise uh, in relation to sleep, uh, so it's hard to say if you should exercise at night or exercise during the day or don't exercise between certain times. But what doctors and researchers can agree on is exercise is beneficial for sleep, sleep quality. Um, adding some sort of physical activity that suits you and your daily schedule uh, is just beneficial for your good night's rest. As I mentioned how light and sound affect sleep, and nowadays our devices or technologies become a factor in sleep quality as well. For most people, we spend a lot of time on our devices, smartphones, laptops, e-readers, which those stimulate our brains on many levels. Our devices influence our environment in regard to light and sounds, but also create physiological responses as well. Depending on what you are doing on your device, the content you are engaging in may be like a YouTube video, as you are trying to relax and take yourself into a sleep state, it makes your brain release cortisol, which provides some sources of alertness and energy that keep you awake. If you do fall asleep, it may not allow you to achieve adequate amounts of deep sleep. So you, so you might uh, wake up uh, not feeling as rested as you would like. Try to minimize your devices and technologies at least two hours before you go to bed to encourage your body's natural response and release of melatonin to guide you into sleep. Health issues, hormonal factors, and simply aging all factor into uh, sleep quality from start of your sleep to finish or when you wake up. If you, uh, if you have tried mitigating some of the factors with no results, it might be time to consider speaking with your doctor or a sleep professional. A sleep disorder or an underlying health issue may be the cause of trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or getting back to sleep. Nighttime awakenings associated with a health issue are often due to a symptom of that issue. For example, coughing might uh, wake up a person with lung disease. Heartburn might wake up a person with GERD. Hormone changes in women who are pregnant tend to experience a reduction in sleep quality, especially during the third trimester. As you grow older, you tend to spend less time in deep sleep and more time in light sleep. Light sleep, as you might uh, know or can guess, makes it easier for you to wake up during the night. Uh, as you age, your circadian rhythm changes as well, um, which can lead to falling asleep earlier and uh, waking up earlier than you would like. So maintaining a good sleep schedule and good sleep hygiene, um, even making adjustments can help facilitate good quality sleep as you age.
Thank you, Kyle. So now I will go over some mental and emotional factors that could influence your sleep, ranging from mood disorders, stress, relationships, and just overall relaxation. So looking at mood disorders, anxiety is frequently connected to sleeping problems. Excess worry and fear make it harder to fall asleep and stay asleep through the night. Sleeping difficulties have been found for people with various types of anxiety, including generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, or PTSD. As you can imagine, distress about falling asleep can itself complicate matters, creating a sleep anxiety that reinforces a person's sense of dread and preoccupation. Although the impacts of anxiety disorders can be substantial, they are one of the most treatable mental health disorders. There are many treatments that can help uh, ease anxiety, especially in relation to sleeping. So speaking to your doctor and determining the best course of treatment for you is going to be crucial here. As Kyle mentioned before, if you've tried some adjusting some of these other factors that we've talked about from environment to physical, to maybe some stress relaxation techniques. And if you're finding that after you've adjusted a few of those, you've tried them out for a few weeks, and they're still consistently not able to fall asleep or get deep sleep, not waking up feeling rested, it's, we highly recommend that you speak to your physician, your doctor, therapist, whatever you need to do to uh, have that professional help you along the way. So we've mentioned a few healthy sleep habits. So if one doesn't work, try another. There are so many different things that you can try as Kyle went through that huge long list. And that's just the few that we researched and can think of. There's so many other factors that influence sleep. So if one habit doesn't work, one pre-bed routine doesn't work, don't give up, try another. And it's really important that you keep working to find what works best for you. Some people are so different. Like my husband, for example, loves listening to podcasts going to sleep, but I cannot stand voices all night long trying to fall asleep. So I have a fan next to me to help me fall asleep because that kind of drowns out the noise of his podcast. So we've got lots of noise in bed sometimes. Uh, so trying to build those sleepy, those healthy sleep habits. And then you can also try some relaxation, relaxation techniques that help uh, with anxiety or depression. So I found a few animations. So these are YouTube videos, the first two square and triangle breathing. And it's a YouTube video, it's an animation that tells you when to inhale, when to hold, when to exhale, and you can follow along with that. Sometimes that's easier to have that visual representation of what your breathing should look like versus counting one, two, and then trying to count and trying to hold your breath and all of that. So check out those animations. As Laura mentioned, we will be sending out the slide deck afterwards. So you'll be able to have all of these links. Uh, the triangle breathing just simulates an inhale and then an exhale. So it's nice to calm your breathing down. And then uh, as a Medtronic benefit, everyone has access to Ginger and Ginger purchased Headspace. So Ginger and Headspace are kind of linked together now, if you're not aware of that. So Headspace is a, they have a YouTube channel. They also have an app and it's guided meditations, breathing techniques, uh, short animations, very similar to the other ones I've shared. So that's another great resource. They have guided meditations to help you sleep. And then additionally, Will is another resource through Healthier Together that you can access at no cost to you. And there are over 600 sessions, something like that for a wide range of topics, but there's a huge section on sleep music, sleep meditations, and educational videos to help you with your sleep. So now looking at stress. Stress and anxiety often lead to insomnia and other sleep problems. Chronic stress over time can also influence those other health conditions that Kyle was mentioning. A person may be diagnosed with chronic insomnia if their symptoms occur at least three times per week for at least three months. So that might be a good uh, tracker or a timeline for you to, if, to notice if you're struggling with your sleep, if it's around three times per week for at least three months, then that's a, maybe a good 
uh, marker for you to then speak to your doctor after you've, after you've tried a few things for some, some months. Persistent stressors can heavily contribute to chronic insomnia. Those could include problems or dissatisfaction at work, crucial life changes, family relationship difficulties, and so much more. You have a network in your brain that regulates your body's hormonal response to stressful situations. Cortisol, adrenaline are two stress hormones that are released. The body natu naturally produces cortisol throughout the day and our cortisol levels spike immediately after we wake up and they gradually decrease throughout the day. This added cortisol regulated by your brain is the reason why you might feel hyper or alert during stressful situations, but this can cause you to have that crash once stress subsides. So whether your stress is short-term or acute or it's chronic, all of that will influence the quality of your sleep. So what can you do to mitigate your stress to uh, help influence your sleep? I've linked our under pressure wellness webinar that you may have attended, where you can, we learn about managing your pressure to help keep your stress levels down. And like we've mentioned before, consistency is going to be really important here. Picking a habit to implement and then sticking with it for a few weeks. As we've mentioned before, it can take anywhere from 18 to 254 days. Let's almost a year on average to form a habit for it to become automatic. And your sleep works just the same way. If you try a new thing every single night, your body's going to not really know how to adjust. And it's unfortunately probably not going to get the sleep that you want. So things won't be perfect overnight. And so it's important to stay consistent. Next, you have to give yourself time to decompress. We hear from employees all the time that you're going from this meeting to this meeting, you gotta go to lunch, pick up the kids, take the kids to soccer, get the kids home, make dinner, then have a date night and then do this and do that. And so you're constantly moving from one thing to the next. Then all of a sudden you're like, okay, time to sleep. And then your body still is in that high alert, constant go, go, go. As Kyle said, your body isn't then prepared to start the release of melatonin and to help you feel sleepy and to start calming your body down. So whether you're finishing a tough workout, frankly getting the kids to bed, or even watching a movie before bed, maybe a series that has you on the edge of your seat, you need to give your body and brain time to decompress from all that action so that the cortisol levels can drop. And then it's important to set boundaries when possible so that you can permit time for yourself to relax and unwind before your nighttime routine begins. And then you can also try some relaxation techniques. We've gone into depth in so many of our other webinars and feel like we're just hitting it with the hammer over and over again. And it's because this is really important and could be really beneficial if you just try one or two of these items. So you can try journaling, meditations, mindfulness, gratitude, grounding. If you have questions about any of these particular relaxation techniques, feel free to reach out, ask a question, and we will definitely help you find maybe the type of meditation that would be best for you in your current situation. And then looking at relationships. Problems with relationships influence our sleep. So many people could potentially have a sleep partner or other people in the house that impact your quality of sleep. Will has a section called improve relationships. So you can work through those self-guided sessions to help deepen relationships, focus on family, connect authentically and so much more. Research shows that those with higher quality relationship satisfaction and connection with their family or sleep partners will have better quality sleep. Now, an other option is the National Sleep Foundation found that nearly 25% of all couples in the U.S. sleep in separate beds. This, as we've discussed, each individual is different, and so it, you might require different conditions for optimal sleep. That's something that took me quite a few years to figure out with my partner is that we need separate 
covers. We each have our own comforter. I have a fan to drown out his podcast that I can't stand. So it's important to communicate your goals. If you're struggling with sleep, you have to tell your family, have to tell your roommate, whoever that could also be living in the house with you, what you're experiencing, because they might not even know that their snoring is driving you crazy. You have to let them know so that you can help mitigate those issues. It's okay to experiment and look for new ways to communicate your sleep issues. What has maybe worked in the past for a one year, five year, 20 years may not be working now. And it's okay to try something different and to find new ways to improve your sleep. One size doesn't fit all. And like we've said, there's a wide range of factors to consider. So try to identify areas that may be working and look into other areas that may need support. So we came up with a process or a strategy to help you get back to sleep because we know that is important for everybody here. So this is our not really proven process, but this is based off of a lot of the research about getting back to sleep. This is what we've compiled and tried to give you some steps that you can take. So say you, your initial, you're upon your initial wake up in the middle of the night. Give yourself some time to try and fall back asleep without changing anything. So try to keep your eyes closed, find your go-to sleep position. And if this doesn't work and you're still struggling to fall asleep, determine what could be the potential cause for your sleep disruption. So what could maybe be the cause? Are you too warm? Has your white noise music stopped if you've set a timer? Did you maybe have caffeine too close to bed? Are you anxious about events that are coming up the next day? As Kyle said, you may not be able to just change your mattress right there, or you can't go back, unfortunately, and not have that cup of coffee. Some situations can be improved right away. Or you can adjust the temperature, or try a breathing technique, do a few relaxing stretches, and other situations could be more long-term or too late to adjust for the night. So that can be a sign to look to the next day and see if there are other things that you can adjust to have better sleep the next night. So if you've determined the potential cause and you maybe have tried a few solutions for the potential cause and you still can't fall back asleep within 15 to 30 minutes, do something relaxing elsewhere. Long term, you want to associate your bedroom with sleep. If you constantly spend your time in bed worrying, awake, stressed because you can't fall back asleep, this can impact your quality of sleep in the long term. So once you go and do something relaxing elsewhere, you can restart your pre-bed routine or you can come back to bed when you're tired. So looking at the buckets that we've discussed, here are a few things to try and a few things to avoid within these different areas. So if it's potentially something environmental and you can't get back to sleep, you could enjoy, adjust the sound, the noise settings, whatever you have going nearby to adjust. Maybe you have your windows open and you can hear cars driving down your street. Maybe you got to close the windows, maybe turn on the air conditioning, whatever it may be. Adjust the temperature in your room with blankets, clothing, fans. And within the environmental area, here are some things to avoid. If you are wearing a sleep mask, avoid removing the sleep mask if you wake up in the middle of the night. Over time, if you're using a sleep mask regularly, the process of putting it over your eyes, that muscle memory triggers the pathways in your brain to say, oh, okay, time to sleep. But then if you take it up over time, that's associating waking up, mask is up. So try to keep the sleep mask on, even if you wake up, maybe just peek underneath if you wanna check the time and then avoid turning on the lights. We were just talking about this morning, joking around that, you know, if someone else in your room wakes up in the middle of the night, try to talk with them. Hey, don't turn the lights on if you're going to the restroom, maybe have a uh, small night lights, um, you know, lighting your pathway to the restroom and avoid looking at your phone or other devices with Apple, Android, there are so many tools on phones nowadays that you can adjust for sleep, do not disturb. Um, even if you have family or kids that you wanna check on, you can set special alerts in your phone. So I have 
my favorite. So it's like my mom, my sister, my dad, my husband. If they contact me, I get an alert. But if anybody else doesn't, I don't. So that's another thing that you can try. And then avoid standing up or moving around too much. Try to stay stationary, find your comfy position and avoid fidgeting. Physical, you could drink a calming tea, practice those deep breathing exercises. And I listed out a few relaxing stretches that you can do lying down in bed that would that are associated with calming your nervous system. So we have reclined figure four, which is just crossing one leg over the other, uh, bound angle, which is basically like butterfly diamond, just laying on your back, reclined tree. Most people know tree pose. You just lay on your back and bend one knee and open your knee out to the side. Happy baby, you just reach up for your feet. You can rock side to side and then feet up the wall. If, if you're not up against the wall, you can just take your legs up, straight up to the ceiling. And that helps, you know, send the fluid in your blood back towards your heart. And that's associated with calming down your nervous system. So those are a few different stretches you can try if you don't want to have a stimulus of other sound noises. And then mental emotional, you can try many of the relaxation techniques. Uh, as I was kind of looking into more anxiety, they uh, said to write down what your worries are. Have a notebook journal nearby. So if you're wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, gosh, I really need to think about that presentation. I can't forget to get milk at the grocery store. Write down whatever is causing those worries so then you don't have to think about it anymore. Another grounding technique is the three, three, three rule. So you name three things that you see. So if you're asleep, maybe you see your blanket, your bedside table, and your water bottle. Then you name three sounds that you hear. So maybe you hear the whir of your fan. If you have a clock that's ticking, maybe you can hear the clock ticking and maybe you hear your partner snoring and then move three parts of your body. So maybe flex and point your foot, bend your knee, and then maybe rock your head side to side. Thinking about that three, three, three rule can help uh, ease the anxiety, ease the worries, and then stick to your routine. So I know that was a lot of information that Kyle and I covered. Hopefully that helps you have a better idea of some things that you can try. So now we'll send it over to Isaac, to talk about sleeping strategies for children. Okay, thank you, Anna. Well, hello everyone, Isaac here. Uh, today I want to briefly share some strategies and tools for helping getting back to sleep and staying asleep for specifically if you have a zero to five-year-old. I know this is a very specific target audience, but I felt the need to share this because personally, I know the effects of uh, that a slide, that a, that a child not sleeping can have on the whole, on them and then the entire family uh, when everyone is sleep deprived. So if you're currently experiencing this, have a little one on the way or know someone going through this situation, this can be valuable information to you. Um, our daughter now 16 months, averaged four to six uh, extended wake-ups throughout the night. And the only soothing strategy we had was nursing her back to sleep, which in turn led to more wake-ups and longer wake-ups and all that stuff. And so after applying these uh, strategies that I'm going to go over, um, our daughter now sleeps 10 to 11 hours at night with very seldom wake-ups. So no guarantees on any of this, but it's worth a try. Okay. So strategies here, the overall goal of these strategies is to help your child, give them the awareness that they're in a safe and supported space. A lot of sleeping issues are caused by they, are, they don't feel safe in their sleeping space. So just making the awareness that they're safe, they're supported, they're not abandoned, and that their cries uh, will be heard and always responded to. So the very first strategy there, uh, probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, is uh, getting your child on a consistent sleep schedule and bed bedtime routine that aligns with your sleep recommendations for their age. As Laura showed in a previous slide, within a 24-hour period, including naps, zero to two-year-olds require 12 to 17 hours, and three to five-year-olds require 10 to 13. 
Uh, this is important because it can pre prevent your child from becoming over or under tired, which can lead to very difficult bedtimes and frequent extended wake-ups throughout the night. You can see on the slide there, uh, just a brief example of what one could look like. Uh, uh, 6.30 a.m. wake up, noontime nap, which lasts anywhere between one to two hours, bedtime at seven. That's our routine currently, and that falls within our daughter's recommended sleep, about 12 and a half to 13 and a half hours total throughout the day. So another useful tool is a light slash sound mach uh, combo machine. Uh, making sure the sound machine is at least seven feet away from the bed at a low volume, uh, 50 decibels to be correct or exact, one at below 50 decibels pre can prevent any damaging effects on the child's hearing and auditory development. The sound can be calming to the child, as we've kind of talked about throughout this webinar. But a big reason why we use the light part of the device is that it provides communication of the routine and bedtime. The slide provides an example. When the light is on in Janie's room and it's green, it says, OK, we're going to bed. We're reading our, we're getting in the crib. We're getting a few, one more, like one more story in. And when it turns red, that's the symbol that, okay, it is time to sleep. This is the time when we sleep. And we actually leave a very, it's a very low intensity of a light. So it's not like a big bright light in her room all night, but we leave that red light on throughout the entire night until it turns yellow. And that's the sign, hey, Playtime, it's it's yellow light, the sun's up, let's it's time to wake up and ex enjoy the day. Uh, this helped a lot with wake ups in the middle of the night uh, as far as the length of them, because when she would wake up, she would see, oh, it's red light. I'm still in my safe, supported space. I can I'm nothing, nothing scary is happening. I'm used to seeing that red light. Okay, I can go back to bed. There's the one, so that light sound machine combo is, has been very beneficial to, to us and for a lot of other people. Another recommended tool is a baby monitor that you can see and talk to your child through. When installed, be sure to show your child that you are indeed the voice coming from the camera on the wall. This can help them know that even though you aren't right by them at night, you're still very close and that they are both heard and seen, not abandoned and in a safe place. The child being aware of this can make shorter wake-ups and provides the ability to soothe the child from the parent's room. Obviously, if the child is very upset, you want a lot of times you want to go in and just say, hey, check in, I'm still here. Uh, we had that experience last night. We had to sell them wake up in the middle of the night and she was not happy. So that's what we did. We, we got off the monitor, went in there, said, hey, we're still here. Nice to see you. That's what's going on. Uh, and the last strategy. So this one is, is a, was a fun one here. So the last strategy is using a bedtime mantra as your child is working on falling asleep or while they are asleep. Uh, for two straight weeks, we played throughout the entire night on loop a recorded mantra of my wife's voice on a Bluetooth speaker simply saying, night, night, sweet Janie, night, night. Uh, this helped our daughter know that she was in a safe, supported and uh, place and greatly decreased wake up duration's. Uh, we still occasionally use this recording while traveling. Janie is sick or teething, or if we feel she needs a refresher of the mantra due to an increase of middle of the night wake-ups. Using that monitor that we just talked about, we simply recite a couple of lines of the mantra now. She wakes up in the middle of the night and she typically will fall right back asleep with the exception of last night. So it's not always a fall, you know, completely, completely the same. So gotta always mix it up, I suppose. 
So here are some recommendations, some resources, the AAP, that's the American uh, for Pediatrics, American Academy for Pediatrics. The uh, link for a light sound combo machine is right there. That's the one we use. We really like that one because you can control that one from your phone. The baby monitor that we use that we really like, there's a link for that. And what we did, and I highly recommend if any of you or know anyone that's going through anything like this, the Battelle Remote Sleep School, it's, it's, how, it's a better way to implement all these strategies in a, in a full sleep school type uh, setting. So um, highly recommend that, all that stuff. So. Here we go, moving on to upcoming events. So Greener Together, we have uh, for our healthy habit in July, uh, track a healthy habit each week towards increasing an impact on your community. You can visit the Medtronic uh, Women's Network website for details and a full list of events and challenges. Also there, join the live cooking demo with Kyle on Wednesday, July, uh, 12th at noon central time. Kyle is an amazing chef. So I, I hope all of you tune into that. Also our two week Tabata challenge from July 10th to July 23rd. Challenge yourself for the next 14 days to perform the designated daily exercise following the Tabata training protocol. You can find the video here for a preview of the moves and also a challenge PDF for more information. And then for our next wellness webinar on July 28th at 1230 Central Time, 1230 PM Central Time, you can join us and we're going to discuss whether you're on the, for work, on vacation, it's hard sometimes to keep with your wellness goals and your fitness goals. And so we were gonna discuss a bunch of different ways on how you can keep up with those. So all aboard the wellness train there. As a reminder for our daily opportunities, you can take a physical and mental pause from work to distress, maybe move a little bit and re-energize your day. Under each column, you'll find links to add events or invites to your calendar. Join the Zoom meetings and live streams anytime you can. We have those guided meditations from uh, taught by Laura. They're great, good way to unwind and just full refocus for the day. Our flex breaks, which are short guided stretching sessions uh, taught by Kyle. Those are amazing, make you feel great Monday through Thursday. And then our fit breaks, 10 to 15 minute low impact office friendly workouts, no equipment workouts led by myself. And then we have our YouTube channel, which you can watch a bunch of different videos on demand, as well as a, except for today, which you can join me in about 15 minutes at 1230 for a Tabata live class and get after it that way. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, we had a question in the chat, does magnesium help to fall asleep? I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, so I can, Marie, I can definitely look into that and send you a private message afterwards. Uh, please, if you feel, if you'd like a uh, comment or share in one takeaway in the chat, something that you liked. If you have any questions, this is your chance to uh, also ask those questions in the chat. If we don't know the answer right away, we'll definitely get back to you. Once we send out this slide deck, you'll be able to click where it says earn points for attending here. You can uh, earn healthier together reward points. We'll basically email you a voucher code. And then make sure you join our healthier together Yammer community. Here are all of the contact information for all of us and our certifications, different areas we like to focus on, and then the links to our Healthier Together Yarmouth community and then our YouTube channel. Yes, a lot of people like the 3-3 rule. After I tried that yesterday when I woke up and that definitely helped me get back to sleep. Yes, communication, very important. Thank you all for uh, 
sharing. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us directly. Otherwise, we will see you next time for our Wellness on the Go wellness webinar. Have a great day.